Welcome all. Uh, we finished uh, almost mo one month project, free gesture exhibition of Ula Sikle at uh, the CCA Ujazdowski Castle. And tonight's lecture is titled Thinking and Moving Through, uh, through Samples. Uh, our guest, the main, our main guest, Daniel uh, Gube, is a Brussels-based researcher and curator. He graduated at the Architecture University in Venice uh, got the PhD in cultural studies. He worked in Palermo, Valencia, uh, Berlin. His research political philosophy of arts, lectures regularly in Beirut and teach at the Royal Art Academy in Brussels. Uh, that's, I will uh, say it very briefly. So without further ado, uh, uh, Daniel, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, enjoy the uh, presentation and lecture and I hope you will join us afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Karat. Uh, thanks, uh, I mean, thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, more specifically, I would like to thank uh, Konrad, Agnieszka, uh, Ula for this nice invitation. And, um, and even more, I would like to uh, thank uh, Poli Chain who joined me in this adventure of um, of experimenting uh, how to think through the topic of sample, and this uh, the idea of the, of the lecture of tonight was born out of a conversation with uh, Ulla Sikl um, when we were speaking about her practice, and I I was working already about sample and how to think or what how the notion of sample might be a, a tool through which to think beyond the field of, uh, of music. Um, and, uh, and that's when, when we decided to, uh, to do something that, I've did, uh, that I did already once before, which is this idea of a kind of lecture DJ set. So um, uh, putting together um, reflections with different instruments, so how can words uh, contributing the reflection, how can the act of DJing as well, not simply, I mean, it's far from simply accompanying the music, but really being a second way of reflecting on the same topic. So we will be, uh, it, the, there will be a small um, battle <laughs> between the two of us emerging together words and music in the idea of opening a reflection of sample, as Conrad was saying, uh, more than having a kind of um, Q&A at the end, we would like to invite you to join us here um, at the end around um, the music and we will have a more informal conversation. So I would like to start from, uh, uh, from one sentence um, and saying that uh, the whole of this talk, the one I'm going to say this, uh, this evening, or any parts of it, can be pronounced by other or by any of you and hence might be produced by you without permission from the author or from the publisher. So um, this was just like a short introduction that, that I wanted to use to introduce the topic of sample. Um, and I would like to start from a more historical perspective on sample. So on a Sunday morning in 1988, uh, the producer and songwriter James Ntume was having a conversation with Nilsson uh, um, George about the emerging of hip hop culture. So it's it's the end of the 80s, and hip hop culture is emerging. Uh, and uh, uh, Nelson George, um, in in a recent article that he wrote, which is uh, titled "Sample This," um, writes that um, Tume, in this conversation, spent much of this morning blasting hip hop record production for its slavish reliance on record sampling. So he was really against sampling. And he charged that, and I'm quoting what Mtume was saying, he said that this is the first generation of African Americans not to be extending the range of music and that the resulting recordings were nothing but Memorex music. So to further illustrate his creative disdain, Ntume made a bold analogy, and he said that, for example, sampling James Brown drum beats in a hip-hop album was like him 
sticking chapters from James Baldwin in his, in his book and claiming that the words are his. So simply stealing what someone else did. So this is the way he describes sampling. So uh, I have to say that the practice of sound sampling started way before hip hop music and actually it started in the music concrete um, of the vanguards. And among the first experiments, um, there's a, an Egyptian mus a musician, which is uh, Halib al Dhab, which was working with sampling in the, in the 30s in Cairo. But then it's only from the 50s that producers started to sample and they were doing this mainly to disguise the absence of a live instrument. So for example, if a horn was needed and didn't have the money to have it, or a particular keyboard line was missing, pop producers were uh, used to sample it from another record, trying to camouflage them artificially in the process. But then in the 80s, uh, the hip hop culture is the first culture that explicitly makes use of the sample not simply as a tool to hide missing um, instrument, but as a pillar of a practice. So it's not simply a tool, but it's almost, almost a philosophy that is at the core of a hip hop culture. And actually it reclaims the possibility of recontextualizing someone else sounds and hip hop became the first popular music genre based on the act of sampling. So often the sample, um, so I want to just like to do this short historical um, perspective on sample to say that very often the sample is analyzed in relation to what it produces, so to the final song. We always like think about samples, analyzing what samples are present in a, in a song that we know. But the question that I would like to address tonight is what if the sample, what is the sample in itself? and how might investigating its essence be crucial for us today. So if, for example, we take the sample in the short moment after it has been extracted from a song and before being part of a new one, so in the moment when we already extracted the sample from another song, what is the peculiarity of that which we have in our hands? So what is the sample, this element that we extracted? And through this uh, lecture, I would like to show how the sample, or to think together, how the sample is different from other notions as the one of fragment, or the example, or the teaser, or the trailers, so different kind of figure that are connected to the idea of partiality. Uh, but how the sample is different from all these other elements, is different from the example, from the fragment, from the trailer and the teaser and almost how can we build a kind of ontology of the sample, so what the sample is in itself. So far from aiming to reconstruct the history of sample uh, within this lecture, I would like more to use the sample as a sample, which means to extract the idea of a sample from its historical perspective, but more to situate it in a kind of unknown territory and we can say that from there, as soon as we extract the sample, a new song might emerge. So the first definition of what the sample is, uh, is an extract. So it's a portion that is taken out from a larger set. Or we can say that it's a small quantity that gives information about a whole. So the sample, it's like the tip of an iceberg that floats above the surface of the visible, but that is still announcing the presence of a larger path or a larger part beneath. So it's the sample is not simply a fragment, but it tells us about the whole it belongs to. So the sample is, we can say, if we use like a grammatical uh, term, we can say that the sample is like a synedoke, so the figure of speech in which a term 
for a part of something is used to refer to a whole. So a parse per totem. So such, for example, like do some example, when we use expressions such as Wall Street um, to refer, that I mean, it's an expression that is used starting from the 70s to refer to, um, to describe the US financial and corporate uh, sector, or for example, when the use of terms new wills that is recurrently used in, in hip hop songs to reference a brand new car. So a sample is a small part or a small quantity that is intended to show what the whole is like. So this is like the usual use of the term. And for this reason, the term is very often used in, in geological extraction. So we speak about mineral samples that are extracted to detect the presence of, for example, petroleum, gas, or mineral deposit, indicating the potential for exploration or production, or to determine physical or chemical properties to ensure that products meet quality standards. So to this extent, the sample has always a relation with the space it belonged to. So it speaks about the moment it was part of a whole. In this sense, we ha have to say that the, the sample always has a relation with the past. So with that whole to which it belonged. So to the, the ground or the, the original song from where it has been extracted. This is the relation of the sample with the past. But the first question that I would like to address is, um, does not the sample have a more complex relation with time? Does it not have a more complex, more than simply referring simply to the past, does it have a multiple relation with time? And I would like to address two different temporalities. So first of all, um, I would like to start from this image, which is um, an image of Gordon Mata Clark, to say that by walking in New York in the, um, in the 70s, one would have had the chance to see this kind of uh, um, buildings, so the work of Gordon Mata Clark, who was extracting samples and cutting through the walls of abandoned buildings. And in a short interview given in May 1976, in relation to a work that was called W. Hall, uh, Mata Clark explained that beyond the information that it gives about uh, the time of construction of building, uh, the sample does something else. And he says that the act of cutting, the, the act of cutting through from one space to another produces a certain complexity. And I'm, I'm quoting right now Mata Clark. And this complexity reveals the autobiographical process of its making. There is a kind of complexity which comes from taking an otherwise completely normal and conventional albeit anonymous situation and redefining it, retranslating it into overlapping and multiple reading of conditions past and present. So Gordon Mata Clark speaks about this act of extracting and producing holes into a building. He speaks about two different temporalities. So uh, that these two different temporality, the past and the present, are embedded in the act of extracting. E extracting. So the sample, according to Mata Clark, does not simply deliver some information about the past it belonged to, but at the same time, it speaks about the time and labor of its extraction. So it speaks about the moment that in which we extracted the sample. So we have to say that the sharp margins of the sample are the autobiographical space that reminds and exposes the process of its making. It was in the, in the same years in New York, 
so in the same years of Gordon Matta Clark, that the emerging hip hop scene starts sampling songs from the past. And while thinking about it, a further temporality and a third temporality beyond the past and the present emerges. So let us imagine a music sample that is freshly extracted from its original context. So we extract a sample and it is there in our hands, referring to the song it originally belonged to, as to the present moment of its extraction. Nevertheless, once there, once we have a sample, so this fragment in our hands, does it not elude, elude already to the, to the possibility of becoming something else? something other than its original song. So it, the sample alludes already to the future song, it is not yet. So these are like the three temporalities of the sample. So it refers to the past, where it belonged, it, it, it refers to the present of the extraction, and it, belongs, or, and it refers to the future that is not yet. So music sampling makes more complex the relation between sample and time announcing in the present of the sample an incompleteness that exceeds the present time. So an investigation, in, one, in an investigation of the ontology of the sample, this becomes a crucial question. So is the sample in its autonomy a complete element or is it always incomplete since it always refers to something that is not yet? and alluding in its present status not only to the past that is not, but also to the future that is not yet. So this is one complex element of the sample. What's the relation between completeness and incompleteness in the sample since it always alludes to something that is not yet? So to understand uh, this, this relation between completeness and incompleteness, I would like to um, shift a bit from the idea of the sample to say that just a decade before hip-hop was emerging in New York, Italian intellectual Pierpaolo Pasolini wrote a short article which is titled The Screenplay as a Structure that Wants to Become Another Structure. So analyzing a singular relation between incompleteness and completeness in another element, so in the idea of the screenplay, that might be useful here to understand this ontology of the sample. So uh, Pasolini writes that the screenplay, so we are speaking about like cinema screenplay, so this text that are used before the film, the screenplay presents itself as a structure in motion, namely a structure endowed with a will to become another structure. So the screenplay constitutively alludes to something more than itself, something other than itself, namely the film that is not yet or the movie that will complete its ontological nature. So the screenplay is caught in this structural dynamic because the screenplay seems apparently to be included in the sphere of the incompleteness, yet it is a peculiar form of incompleteness. So it is incomplete because it's not yet the film and yet we cannot say that it's really incomplete. Indeed, while announcing its incompleteness, the screenplay could not be more complete than what it is. Otherwise, it would be something different and something other than itself. So what Pasolini suggests is that the screenplay can be complete only in the form of its incompleteness. Exactly like a sketch is complete as sketch just if while announcing a future work of art is not already that work of art. So thinking the sample through the screenplay, screenplay helps us in defining its essence. So once extracted from the song and once in our hand, the sample is complete as sample, but at the same time is a completeness that alludes to its completeness in relation to both the song it comes from, so the past, and the one it is not yet. And this incompleteness is not optional, since if it were complete in a different form, so if it were like complete in a form of a completeness, we might say, this would eliminate the lack of fullness that defines, that defines it as a sample and would become 
an autonomous and different object. Hence, I mean, we are, we are driving a bit like in, in philosophy, but I hope it's fine. Hence, to keep itself complete in the form of the, the incompleteness, the sample must, must always have present to itself as a ghost the totality it did not yet achieve. So it cannot isolate itself, but shall always refer to that which it is not yet. So to, to conclude this part, it is important to say that um, this that which it is not, so this future song, is not a defined song, but is a song that is yet, that is still to be composed. So I'm mentioning this just like to um, stress on the fact that the sample is not simply an, the intermediary step in the middle of, the ex of an existing line, but is an open moment in which it announces its life as an incompleteness of something that does not exist yet. So for this reason, if we go back to the idea of the screenplay, Pasolini was writing that the screenplay is a, is a particular process, not being an evolution from A to B, but rather a process of pure and simple dynamism and attention that moves without, without leaving and without arriving. So he was saying that the screenplay is a dynamic structure, yet is one without functionality and outside of the laws of evolution, so without the idea of a line. So the tension that is present in the screenplay, as the one in the sample, alludes to something more, and yet it does not have only one direction. It is a moment of pure contingency that announces the multiple possibilities, so different possible directions, of what is yet to become. So in its essence of incompleteness, the sample announces that it will become a song and reminds us of the open contingency of its future. So once in our hands, the edge of the sample vibrates, announcing th something that is, yet, that is not yet, and its margin invites us to see the contingency of its future, outside a linear idea of its life. So once there, we can say that the sample is a kind of prophecy without content. So it announces something without saying exactly what it will be. Or it, vib it vibrates to announce a future that is yet to be written. Okay, Pasolini wrote this text um, in the 60s, so in a, in a decade that, and a context that was very busy redefining the possibility of writing the future. So also like this text about screenplay is ve very busy about what the relation between an element and the possibility of becoming something else. Uh, and was a decade busy with the idea of imagining other possible worlds, and I would like to uh, take advantage of this um, reflection about the sample to move a bit in the realm of um, political theory to raise a question about what's the possibility of thinking the present as well and thinking politics as well through the notion of sample. Um, more specifically, I would like to, um, to raise a question which is what would emerge if we were to think the present as a sample, so to think our reality as a sample. So far from being a concern of our time, this question about the relation between 
the present or the reality and other possible worlds. It's something that has its roots in, uh, in medieval time. And I would like to uh, move a bit there, just like to, to understand what are the, what's the relevance of the idea of sample in political theory. So in uh, uh, the 13th, 13th century, Thomas Aquinas, um, while writing a text which is called Summa Theologica, was describing the, the creation of the world, and I would like to start from, from this uh, description that might be useful for us today. Because Thomas Aquinas was imagining that um, during the creation of the world, uh, God had first to select one matter, so the matter of the world, and then starting from this shapeless matter that contains different possible shapes, um, he uh, brought one shape to the surface so that a single form or a single shape of the world was created by God among different possibilities that were lying in the same matter. So this is a very famous perspective that is very strong um, in the Middle Ages. Um, and uh, what is important to underline in this perspective is that um, from a, a political perspective, we can say that the reality in which we live is simply one among others, that actually other forms of, of reality could have emerged and maybe might still emerge still they are still living since they are still living in the matter that composed the world and we can almost think of the visible reality as simply one sample extracted from an indeterminacy full of other possibilities so this is like the first perspective but what if we consider our reality as a sample and what if we keep going thinking that the margins of the visible vibrate, announcing the existence of something else beyond its limit, reminding us the existence of another possible configuration. So five centuries after Thomas Aquinas, um, Gottfried Leibniz tries uh, to give a visual configuration of this relation between the real world and other possible world that could have emerged but were not. And in, in 1710, um, he, um, he writes a, a text which is called Theodicy, that um, it's a very charming text where he imagined uh, Theodore, so a priest, who is walking in a, um, a building which is called the Palace of Faith, in which he encounter all different world that could have emerged but were not. So the particularity of this building is that it has a very precise architectural configuration, so it's a, it's a pyramid, so it's a pyramidal building, and made of different rooms, um, and at the top of the, of the pyramid, there's the actual world, so the one in which we live. And then while going down, so like in the second floor down, we could see like small variation so a word that is nearly identical to the one in which we live, but it has like small variation. And then while going down, uh, the variations are always bigger. And it's a kind of endless uh, pyramid because it has only one um, top, which is the world in which we live. But actually the potential variation of the world are endless. So the, the pyramid has one top but has no base. Um, and um, Leibniz imagined the priest Theodore walking in the different rooms of the pyramid of this palace of, of, palace of fate in which um, he encountered, uh, we, we have like to imagine it, but it's very fascinating um, text because he encountered every time um, different words that are slightly different from the one in which we live. So, and that could have been created but were not. So for example, a word where animals are able to speak, or a world that is without plants. Um, yet, if there is nothing melancholic in this uh, flanery with the, the non-actualized world, it is precisely because Theodore's task is to find out exactly how each non-actualized possible is a bad copy of the world in which we live.
So I wanted to describe this um, uh, this architecture, so the pyramid, because it's clear that for for Leibniz there's a kind of hierarchi hierarchical configuration. So the world at top is the one that has been created by God, uh, that is the perfect one, while all the other are simply pale copies or imperfection of other worlds. So it's the whole pyramid is simply constructed to sustain the idea that the world in which we live is the best possible world and that nothing has um, to be changed or to be modified or to, to be configured in a completely different way. Um, and what is even more interesting for me in this architecture and the reason why I also brought it is that um, is the strange and yet clear absence of doors and windows between one room and the other. So it's very unclear how Theodore is walking uh, in the pyramid and how Theodore is, is going from one, from one room to the other. Um, so if one might have the temptation to see the connection of the two models of the, of the pyramid on the one side and the iceberg that I was quoting before on the other, um, in the architecture of Leibniz, there is no continuity between what emerged and what did not. So between the visible world and the potential one. So the visible world isolates itself and almost make one forget that is one among others, refusing to admit the possibility of being different. So it presents itself as a world without alternatives and its isolation become a gesture of protection since each window would question the limit of its uniqueness. So having windows in the, in the different rooms would simply remind that actually other possible configuration and other possible worlds are still possible and could have emerged and might still emerge in the future. So for this reason, one might say that in the relation between the visible and the possible imagined by Leibniz, the world, the world at the top shifts from the idea of the sample to the idea of the example. So what's the difference between the two terms is that the example is etymolog etymologically a sample that has been extracted. So X sample, so it's taken out and disconnected from that totality. That is, that it now looks at from afar, negating its alternatives. So through the pyramid of Leibniz, one can grasp the ontology of the sample in respect to the one of the example. So the sample is separated from the totality, but still virtually immersed in it. It belongs to the matter of Thomas Aquinas, we can say. So a kind of provisor, the sample is a provisory shape announcing itself as one, one among others. So this is where going back to thinking the present through the sample invites to question the modern idea of a present without alternatives. So it invites to hear again or to think the present as a sample, invites to hear again the vibration of the wall and invites to think that our reality has vibrating edges that invites to think about what other possible configurations might be there. So suddenly, let's imagine right now a crack in the floor connecting two rooms of the pyramid. So imagine that we, we produce a hole in, the, in one of the room of the pyramid. So by doing so, we just sampled the figure of Gordon Mata Clark and played inside the palace of fate, connecting, connecting in a very irrespective way two times. So we see a crack in the palace of fate and we can say that its border vibrate alluding to the possibility of something beyond the wall and alluding to a song that is not yet. So in front of the crack, a last perspective emerges. More than being a room, is not the sample exactly this crack? So if the crack connects different space, so the, with the crack in the wall connects two different space, we have to say that the sample 
connects multiple temporalities and invites us there, in a present that exceeds the linearity of time. So I am there in the time of a sample where the present and the possible coexist, and where the different spaces of the pyramid merge, recreating for an instance the image of the iceberg. So the sample is a crack because it invites us to pass from one room to the other, or from one song to the other. So we can imagine the sample as a crack in the floor from, from where other times emerge. So this is what happens as well in music, that we bring simultaneously different times and different epochs at the same time in one song through the practice of sample. So these different times, they do not appear in an archaeological or chronological way, but rather as springs of other temporalities that invade the time of the present, extended it. And maybe for the sample, one might use the, example, the expression cutting through history, that is an expression that was created to describe the work of Gordon Mata Clark. So this is the crack of the sample, something that extends the present by opening a window that allows a multiplicity of time in a single time. So suddenly, while thinking about the sample as something that extends time within time, this sentence travels back in time towards the first words that I were using in this lecture and on the description of this Sunday morning of 1988, and as if we wish to enter in conversation with, with the Mtume that was having such a harsh judgment on the heap of sampling, because we, we might maybe reply to him that maybe it's not true the sampling is not extending the range of music. Maybe it does so, but simply it is not extending it according to the linearity of time or to the idea of novelty but opening the possibility of a temporality beyond linearity. Like, for example, the presence of different quotes, an example that I had in this lecture, um, that are convoking other temporalities in the present of my speaking and in the one of your listening. So this is the ultimate invitation of the sample. While it brings us already into another room, and into another time that is full of different times. Okay, so I would like to conclude right now, or we would like to conclude, and saying that the sample moves in time and brings us from one room to the other in a space that interconnects time and whose margin vibrates, announcing the possibility of something that is yet to be written. And maybe there is a, just like a final shift and perhaps the sample is not simply the room as it appeared at the beginning, we said that it's not simply a room, but maybe it's not even a crack. But maybe it's more the inviting gesture that travels from one room to the other, in different rooms and in different songs. So we, ha we, ha we have to imagine a sample that travels in different songs. And perhaps it is an invitation that circulates like a ghost in the Palace of Fates. So the sample is similar to Theodore, um, the one, so it, it is the one that circulates in the different apartments and accompanies us from time to time. And we can say that this is the life of the sample. So it circulates as an element among the song, as Theodore circulates in the room in which he appears. So this circulation is what suggests the life of the sample. So the sample is as an element that has its own life as the possibility of moving through history and in different elements. And here to conclude is where introducing the notion of sample uh, in dance might uh, suggest a different reflection on movement. So this is what uh, Ulla Sikul was doing in her previous work or in, in, in the work that you saw in the exhibition. Why 
it's, it opens so, much pers so many perspectives, the idea of working with samples wi with movement. Because suddenly it, um, it makes us perceiving the movement as something different. So more than being simply the expression of a body, it helps us seeing the movement and gesture as elements that circulate among bodies and throughout time. So as element, we can, we can imagine movements and gesture as elements that have their own lives and that are simply rendered visible from time to time by the body that hosts them. So suddenly thinking movement through sample and then through sample might um, then, like tr tr while doing this, dancing might be seen as a moment of circulation of the life of the movement among different bodies. So, and a circulation of bodies into the life of the movement. So it's kind of cohabitation of kind of movement that is circulating among different bodies and then suddenly appear on the body of a performer. So it's a kind of encounter between a human life and a, and a non-human life, the life of the movement, suggesting a space beyond anthropocentrism. So maybe at the end, movement and gesture do not belong to the body, so they, are not, they do not belong to us, as uh, Ula Sikl is, is showing, it's like taking gesture from uh, uh, voguing or from pop song or from Sufi. They are, these are like movements that are circulating and that do not belong to us. So it's a kind of shift between property and use. We are simply using this movement and we are not owner of this movement. So the sample as form of life demands this shift from property to use and questions the limit of the notion of copyright. An aspect that, as Nelson George says in the article mentioned at the beginning of the text, uh, was not problematic at all at the beginning of hip hop, so no one, no one was uh, uh, worried about the notion of, of copyright, and actually simply emerged at a certain moment, um, revealing as well a very clear racial, uh, racial aspect, because it only emerged when uh, black artists started to sample white artists, and that there was a, a, a reaction. So the sample uh, helps us like in understanding or challenging the idea of copyright, as for example we said in movement as well, who is the owner of this movement that are appearing on the body. And for this reason, um, there was in the lecture I gave today, uh, there might be an unquoted um, quote, for example the one that I used at the beginning that I would like to however quote to, to end. This, um, this talk, and actually at the beginning I was quoting a short uh, text or a short uh, sentence from Jalal Tufik, um, a, a, a theorist from Lebanon, in a book that he published in New York in 1991, and that now, now his words are living in, the, in this text, and probably will live also like in future texts. So we can say that like every quote is a kind of crack in the vib vibrating wall of a text that reminds us that this text, the one that I was pronouncing, is simply one among others that could have been pronounced, that could have been different, maybe better also, uh, or worse. Um, and, um, and it invites to think the sample as a vibrating sound and, um, and I would like to quote again this, this text as a final um, quote. And this is what Jalal Tufik is saying, saying that the whole of his book, or any part of it, and this is what I was saying about this text as well, so that the whole of this text and any part of it can be created by others and hence may be produced by them and hence by you as well without permission from the author and from the publisher. Thank you.